Marcy, are you starting record? Yes. Okay, and also if you could start the, the uh, closed captions as well, which should be in the same spot there. Okay, right. And if you have any ideas about classes as well, you can drop those into the chat box and we'll take note of that as well. So this is um, a series from our community education series of the OSU Land Steward Program. We put this series of classes together with the help of a volunteer committee of land stewards. If you have any questions or class ideas, you can email me and I'll drop this email into the chat in a little bit. We have with us tonight, um, Marcy Kaminker, who's the chair of our planning committee and she's also a co-host. And so if anything goes wrong, she might take the reins. I'm sure we're, everything is gonna go fine. Um, if you would like to sign up for our email list, you can go to our website just by Googling the OSU Land Steward Program and clicking the join button that's on the home page. If you just scroll down, then you can sign up. That email list only gives class announcements and nothing else. Uh, coming up from our land steward program, we have Firewise Principles, Protecting Homes from Wildfire with Herb Johnson of ODS, and that is one that was rescheduled. You might have signed up for that earlier in the winter, and we had, um, uh, we had to, he couldn't make it, so we rescheduled, and it's still coming up, still plenty of time to do some projects around your house to get home to get your home more Firewise for the coming fire season. April 26th, we have an update on the pesticide stewardship project, which is a monitoring project, another kind of stream oriented project that's looking at pesticides that we find in our tributaries, where they're coming from, what the results are. Um, and I'm curious to find out what the status is of that as well. And Gordon Jones from our Southern Oregon Regional Extension Center will be um, providing that. He's part of that project. If you could please, when we're all done with the program, I will launch a quick poll uh, with just three questions and we would appreciate it if you would take a moment to participate in that poll also. Let's see here. So, ah, yes, I added this slide, which I don't usually have in here, but if you go to our homepage, you'll see our upcoming events. This one down at March 9th is our Firewise Principles uh, class coming up, but there are other ones where our program has been tagged and they might be of interest to you as well. And then others that are from other uh, programs at OSU as well. Um, one that I wanted to kind of highlight is that um, there's a series of fire adapted forest workshops in the Collins in our new Collins Experimental Forest that's up in Gold Hill, uh, a forest that was donated by some longtime residents and partners with our extension center and donated their forest for uh, study and stewardship. So that, that could be an interesting one to get to know that. And I'll, I'll be leading some, some plant workshops there as well. Let's see, enable, okay. And now I get to introduce our, the class of the evening, which is release and recruit. And I've got something blocking what else it says there. Recovering a resil the resiliency of native streamside or riparian forest. And our speaker tonight is from the Rogue River Watershed Council, Lance Wise is the restoration biologist. He works with the private, with private and public landowners to develop creek restoration projects that include streamside rehabilitation rehabilitation and large wood placement to improve fish and wildlife habitat. So I'm gonna stop my share and Lance will take over. And just a reminder to please, if you have any questions or comments or thoughts, drop those into the chat and we'll uh, share them with Lance afterward. Take it away, Lance. All right. All right, should be up. My, can you see my screen? Looks good. Okay, thank you. Uh, also, I have you spotlighted, so you'll, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Um, like Rachel said, I work for the Rogue River Watershed Council, and um, I just wanted to start off tonight with this nice picture of a riparian forest. Uh, this is in South Fork, Little Butte Creek. It's a place I work a lot in. I've been working out with private landowners uh, doing restoration projects for the last six years <clears throat> in this creek. So I've come to know it really well. This is actually standing up on 
the uplands looking out over the forest of a restoration project. It's down there in the floodplain. I wanted to just quickly uh, kind of introduce the organization that I work for. I'm not sure how many of you know what a watershed council is um, or have interacted with a watershed council. Um, and watershed councils are not all built the same way. Uh, there's varying degrees of uh, the amount of work that each of them do. The one that I work for, um, the Rogue River Waters Watershed Council, uh, we have a mission statement. It's stewardship of the Rogue River Watershed through restoration, education, and community involvement. And we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We are registered or recognized uh, with the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. Um, and the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board is a government, a state government entity that was actually started as the governor's watershed uh, enhancement board way back in the 90s by Kitzhaber. And um, as with everything, including ecological restoration science, it has evolved and become more complex. Um, we get a lot of grant funding um, through open solic solicitation grants uh, that are kind of competitive uh, with the acronym is OWEB as you can see here, Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. So <clears throat> it's a really, it's a great, uh, it's a great thing that was started in Oregon and continues to, to carry on and become better. Uh, we're, as a watershed council, we are, are also recognized by the counties that we work in, and that is Jackson and Josephine County. <clears throat> so we can, we can work, uh, in both of those counties on restoration projects. And we currently have five staff members. There's myself and kind of my co-manager, he, he, John Spies, he does the same thing I do, develop restoration projects uh, and implement them and manage them. Uh, we have a community engagement person, Crystal Nichols, uh, and then Anna Johnson is our administrative specialist, and our executive director is Brian Barr. So there's five staff members right now, and we currently have 10 board members, so board of directors, um, who guide our mission and we carry out our mission. And I, I just put up there, there's a, a website that you can go look at uh, the kind of work that we do. <clears throat> so that's who I work for. And um, I'll uh, show you here. This is uh, the, the map. I'll use my cursor a lot when I'm pointing at stuff on slides. So if you see my, my cursor floating around, maybe pay attention to it because I don't always circle things on slides. Um, but the, the map here on the left is our service area. And uh, as you can see, you, get, you go down downstream to you know the Rogue River where it becomes wild and scenic. That's basically where it's Grave Creek. Um, that's basically where our service area starts. And, and it goes upstream and services Grants Pass, Sunny Valley. Um, there's a gap where Valleys of the Rogue Watershed Council still have a service area. Um, and then there's the Applegate Partnership, Watershed, Watershed Council, Illinois Valley, uh, Williams Creek, which is in the Applegate. And then our service area picks back up goes all the way up to the headwaters, um, you know, and that includes Bear Creek. Um, and I have this map on the right that shows where I am really focused at. Uh, 
uh, implementing ecological restoration projects. And um, so Elk Creek is a big focus uh, basin. And that's up, you can see Lost Creek Dam. It's, right, it's, the, it's the last tributary, if you're looking upstream on the left, the north side of the, of the Rogue River. Um, and then I also focus a lot in Little Butte Creek. And like I mentioned, that picture, especially the South Fork of Little Butte, I've been doing a lot of work there. But we also work in uh, another tributary, Salt Creek, a lot, and on the North Fork and into the main stem zone, too. So that's kind of, you know, the, the geographic area that the Watershed Council works in. Um, and then more specifically, where I spend a lot of time. So. <clears throat> and I titled my talk today, um, uh, Release and Recruit, and Recovering the Resiliency of Native Streamside or riparian forests. And I'm gonna go kind of through that process with you. It's part of ecological restoration. So the founding principles uh, of this strategy uh, is based in ecological restoration. <clears throat> and that's defined as the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded damaged or destroyed. And that that is a, an official kind of definition of ecological restoration. And that's where I base all of the projects that I that I, restoration projects that I take on is is thinking about that. And there are two other kind of founding principles to this release and recruit uh, riparian real real riparian rehabilitation. Uh, one is passive restoration. That can be defined as the removal of the source that is causing de degradation and allowing for natural processes to repair damages. So great example of that is livestock exclusion fencing. <clears throat> and then kind of the, the other side of the coin is active restoration. And that can be defined as measures or actions taken to accelerate the recovery process of a damaged ecosystem. So great example of that is noxious weed control. So if you, as you're listening to me talk about this, those real, really those three different things are really important to the stream restoration that I, that I undertake. And again, just to, so there's clarity on, on everything that I'm talking about, the definition of riparian is the plant community growing along the creek or, or a river. So, you know, it can be, some people refer to it as street side vegetation. Riparian has been a word that has been around for a while now. So I, I use that a lot. So when, I'm, when I say riparian, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and another thing to keep in mind <clears throat> as I'm going through this is uh, disturbance regimes. So that's a natural that's natural processes and patterns through time and space that impact ecosystems. So along a stream or a river, great example of that is flooding or high water events. <clears throat> and then, the last definition is uh, ecological restoration, and this is uh, this will be apparent as we're talking about recovering the riparian forest. So, ecological rest, ecological succession is the process by which the structure of a biological community evolves over time. So, the example is a is plant community. So why do we care I mean, about recovering the resiliency of native riparian forests? <laughs> so to me, one of the most important things is the intrinsic value 
of a riparian forest. So it has benefits for plant and animal populations, uh, including humans. Good examples of that is our uh, food and habitat uh, for plants and animals and drinking water for, plant, for plants and animals. And I, I put up this slide down here in the lower, or this picture of, in the lower left-hand corner of uh, macroinvertebrate. This is a caddis fly who actually, some of them make their cases out of plant material. And uh, if you go all the way over to the right lower photograph, these are all alder seeds that are being dropped right now. And that's, you know, they, they use creeks to disperse their seeds. <clears throat> so the other kind of overarching, why do we care, uh, is water quality. So, you know, the filters and exchanges nutrients with groundwater in the creek uh, of, of riparian forests will reduce erosion along the creek. And the shade uh, also helps cool some, the water temperature. And then this real fancy word, allochthonous inputs, um, that is just leaves, branches, and actually whole trees um, that provide food, habitat, and structure to a creek. So again, you know, leaves fall in, twigs fall in the creek, and the macroinvertebrates can, like this caddis fly, can make cases out of it. Also, you know, there's a whole kind of like if anyone is a birder, there's bird guilds. Well, there's functional feeding groups of aquatic uh, macroinvertebrate communities. So you have things like shredders, you have uh, species who eat algae off of rocks, you have predators. So there's a whole really fascinating underwater community with the invertebrates that live there. And these, these allochthonous inputs falling in provide food and habitat uh, and structure for these communities to exist. And which in turn, if you start looking at kind of food web dynamics, there's a lot of fish that eat macroinvertebrates. So it's all a big part of the whole entire ecosystem. And um, many plants are adapted specifically to be in a riparian forest. And I can talk a little bit more about that as well. They're pretty fascinating how the adaptations have come about. <clears throat> so I made this cartoon. Um, and to me, this is a really important thing to kind of keep in mind as we're talking about this, <clears throat> this release and recruit um, strategy of riparian rehabilitation. So you have this stream here and kind of bare bones. It's actually, this is a side channel. It's going uh, along the, the main creek. And then this brown is kind of the higher bank where you have bank cutting that naturally occurs. And you kind of throw over the riparian forest uh, on top of that. And so I think one of the things ideally, if I, I'd like to just have you keep in mind is, um, so if you have a creek that's, for example, 15 feet wide, um, you know, having a 30 to 50 foot buffer kind of on, I would call this the higher side of the creek because you have this higher terrace that's here. And then this 70 to 50, 70 to 100 feet width is kind of that low, people call it a floodplain because as you can see in my beginning, you know, there's a side channel. So it's very connected to the creek, gets water on it a lot in the winter time. So having these kinds of buffers uh, along a stream will do all of those things that I was just talking about in the previous slide. You know, it will cool the water um, and this width down here. It, you know, having water on the floodplain, 
you know, moisture it and you know, a large width on the forest, you know, it creates its own relative humidity. It's much cooler if you've ever walked from the open down into a nice wide uh, floodplain forest in the summertime. It's much cooler. So it creates its own kind of microclimate um, during the hot temperatures of the summer and does, a, you know, it, it has a lot of beneficial attributes to water quality, temperature, um, it's holding water longer into the summer and releasing it. Uh, so it's colder, it's, you know, the groundwater is real shallow, the plants are going to do uh, much better and you're gonna, and you have uh, water being released longer into the summer because it's, it's being stored for a longer period of time, as opposed to if you didn't have a buffer on here at all, the water would just be going right down the creek. So maybe uh, think about that as I'm as I'm going through this presentation as well. Other important thing to me is, you know, many people talk about shade and how important shade is on the creek. One thing that I'd really like you to keep in mind is, if you put shade all over the creek and there's no light penetrating down into the creek, uh, that means that there's no primary production and there's no algae growing, things like that. And that affects the aquatic invertebrate community. So I think a really good rule of thumb is if you have 75 to 80% plant cover or shade on the creek, that's really gonna have the beneficial attributes of, of cooling the water temperature by reducing the solar load, it's hitting the water surface and also allowing light in so there can be the necessary processes um, you know, for what I just mentioned um, with the, the invertebrate production. <clears throat> the other thing that I, I, I hear I've been doing this for a long time and, and I understand that people are concerned about bank erosion um, and there's a lot of excessive bank erosion based on some of the land use practices. However, if you don't have some bank erosion that's occurring, there's no inputs to the stream bed. So, you know, salmon, they use gravel to spawn in to have, you know, they build their nests or their reds in these gravels. There's, there's fine sands um, for, you know, species like Pacific lamprey that as uh, when they're lar larval fish, they burrow into these fine sediments. So, you know, another thing just to kind of keep in mind, you, we're not going to stop bank erosion. And for what I do, I, I'm, not, I'm not designing these projects with landowners to completely stop bank erosion um, because it is a natural process and it is needed uh, for the health of the stream. And a matter of fact, for the forest because it moves around uh, those sediments that create soil. <clears throat> so I'll go back. So you have, have this cartoon of a stream that I made. <clears throat> and then I wanted to show you uh, if this map on the left is of, it's light penetrating um, the ground. So it basically, it's called LIDAR, if anyone's ever heard of LIDAR. Um, it basically strips all the vegetation and this is the bare earth. So I just wanted to give you an example of what I was talking about um, with you know side channels um, and low floodplain terraces. So you have all of this area here, and you can see there's all these old channels, and some of these channels actually are still active. 
that go across the floodplain. And if you put the vegetation back on on the right, you can see, you know, just kind of look back and forth where you have these nice extensive um, floodplain forests. And actually, I'm this is a I'm working in this area. So this floodplain forest here, I've been working on that with a private landowner since 2016. And we've uh, completed this release and recruit strategy on this floodplain. This is uh, like 300 feet wide for here. This is a South Fork Little Butte actually. Um, and if you go upstream, I actually worked with this landowner as well. And we, we put a fence along the creek to keep the cows out and um, also did a restoration project project here. And you can see, you know, so there's agriculture happening on some of these floodplains and there's also areas that don't have ag agriculture on it. So just two examples, but I, my main point on this was, you can really start, when you start looking at LIDAR, which is to me fascinating, um, you can really start telling a lot and I use LIDAR um, a lot of times to develop these ecological restoration projects. So I'm kind of going back and forth using ecological restoration and what we're really focused on is an action of, as part of the ecological restoration, which is the riparian re re rehabilitation that I've now calling more release and recruit than I'm going to explain here soon. I'm sure many of you who own, if you own a property that has creek front to it uh, or other places on your property possibly, you've all seen this before. This is Armenian blackberry. Some people call it Himalayan blackberry. Um, and it, this is a, these are two different restoration projects that I manage <clears throat> and so I, my, I think my main point here is we've started working on both of these projects. One, the one on the left uh, literally started in the fall of 2021. This one on the right, we started that one in 2018. That's what it looks like now. I just took these pictures not too long ago. So started with that and we like to get rid of Armenian blackberry because it's a noxious weed. That's what it looks like. One on the left was, was cut in uh, November and um, it, was, it was actually sprayed with herbicide in October. And then we went back after the blackberry uh, died and we cut down the dead canes. And then this, this one on the right, as I said, um, we've been working on this one for a while and there's native plants coming back in. We did some planting on this project. I think the main thing here though is what we're doing, if you go back to those, uh, that one of the founding pr or principles that I was talking about and one of, the, one of the things to keep in mind with the definitions I gave is disturbance. So here it's not a flood necessarily, However, um, we are getting rid of something that was impeding the recovery of the native riparian forest or the existence of the native riparian forest because the blackberry had completely dominated these areas. And I mean, just this is 20, 25 feet tall on this right picture. So, there was no recruitment um, coming in, which is part of why I call this release and recruit because it's the natural recruitment of the native plant community. So that's, that's an example of the disturbance we create with an active restoration action. And then we also use the passive part to let the uh, native plant community start naturally recruiting. So here's another example of disturbance that happens to be a flood. This is a, 
I work with some landowners and they used to be pilots and they flew over South Fork Little Butte in 2000. So this was after the 1997 flood, or if you live farther up north in the Willamette, the 1996 flood, the big floods that happened in 96, 97. So you can see as you kind of look down through here, uh, the flood scoured large gravel bars throughout this entire system and other places. Um, you can kind of see the natural wood trees that came in uh, that are in the creek. But just keep that in mind for a second, okay? So that was 2000. So this Google Earth picture was taken last year. So it turns out that native riparian forests are totally ex adapted to disturbance and they actually thrive on it. So you have something like that happens and 20 years later, it's recovering really well. I mean, this, this stream, this is all down to bare rock material. I mean, it, it, there, it probably took all of the soil that existed there and washed it away. So it's pretty amazing to me how resilient the, this plant community, the riparian forest is uh, along a stream. I just wanted to give you that example. Uh, kind of just think about that, you know, with flooding and everything. Okay, so we'll get we'll get into the more of the specifics of the, the actual presentation release and recruit. But I just wanted to give you kind of some background on on uh, how I think about this when um, I'm working on restoration projects with landowners and uh, or public land managers. So here on the left, we have the release, what I, what I have, have, I call the release. So you have noxious weed control. We use mechanical treatments and chemical treatments. And, you know, one of the, most important things is, and I say we because I'm one person, I hire contractors, professionals who are knowledgeable and experienced. So I can't do this work without the landowners volunteering their land to do this and a bunch of really awesome contractors. So that's the collective we. Uh, and when I make these statements. <clears throat> so application timing is totally key. Um, and I, what I mean by that is how many times you're doing this, the noxious weed control in a year. And then also uh, depends on the noxious weed species when you treat it. And also I'll talk a little bit more about this what kind of herbicide that you use on specific things. <clears throat> and of course, part of this release is you're being careful um, and that has some, some to do with the timing. I can talk about that in more depth if we want to, uh, but you, we're always trying to preserve the native plants, not just the large overstory trees, uh, there's a lot of times where you have these large patches of Armenian blackberry and growing underneath of that are, you know, native shrubs like snowberry and all kinds of things. So we're really careful about cutting and spraying uh, not to harm the native plants as much as possible as we're getting rid of these noxious weeds. And we have, I call them intensive. So Contractors are out there a lot over the first, at least five years. I'm starting to, to be able to get funding that I, I'm extending that to seven years of really having contractors out there knocking back the noxious weeds, getting almost getting rid of them. And then the long-term stewardship. So, you know, birds fly around, they eat 
Armenian blackberry and then they go and they defecate and it spreads the seeds and other things like bears. Also, there's a, a whole slew of animals that are transporting seeds around. I mean, that's part of the plant adaptation is to how they uh, disperse themselves. <clears throat> so the long-term stewardship, it never really ends. And a lot of times landowners I work with, you know, they they become very committed. Once we, I kind of would describe this first five years to seven years of the heavy lift. And by that time, by the, by the time we're finished with that, then, you know, it's pretty easy for someone to go from the wall of blackberry to going out and, you know, plucking some new sprouts of blackberry or, or if they see a, you know, a teasel rosette pop up. Um, and, you know, if the landowner isn't, isn't capable of that, you know, there's pretty uh, inexpensive ways to have a contractor come out occasionally. And, you know, we can provide resources so that kind of thing. And by, by the time five to seven years is up, I have a really great relationship with the landowner. And, and so, you know, there's always ways to figure out things, but it, there really is a long-term stewardship. Um, and the people who uh, we apply for grants and uh, to do this work are starting to really, I think, shift their focus more to that that long-term stewardship. <clears throat> so the right side of this is the, the recruit part. So again, as we're releasing the, the riparian forest from the noxious weeds, you know, we're preserving the native plants um, as best as we can. And then really understanding the species life history. Um, so this whole recruitment, uh, you know, sometimes I, I have examples of it. You know, I have projects that are two and you know went through two or three growing seasons, and the response is just, you know, it it blows my mind sometimes that the native plants are coming back so well, and we just really had to get create that disturbance, get the noxious weeds out of the way, out of the you know, the competitive, what happens, you know, if, if they're competing for resources, nutrients and light. So um, I, there's, you know, a lot of diversity in a riparian forest um, of species. So really getting to know different species, where they grow, um, how they reproduce, um, and there's a lot of different examples of species, you know, that reproduce vegetatively, like willows. Willows are a great example of they're they're designed, they've evolved to break off, float downstream, get stuck in some sand, and then they can sprout. Um, you know, the black cottonwood, the overstory tree. I've I've seen many examples where we've cleared a blackberry and there are just sprouts coming up all over the place and they're sprouting from roots. Um, it's not even seed. They're just popping up from an old tree, uh, the, the root network. So pretty, pretty interesting and amazing things. And it's really good to understand. And you can start making decisions about what you're doing on a restoration project. <clears throat> So sometimes uh, we will go in and, you know, we can use native seeding. Um, so I, I like to do this on areas where I'm not really seeing woody vegetation come back in. And, you know, the, I, I kind of let the projects and the sites tell me what they want. You know, the forest is coming back. I'm observing and watching and responding to what their response, what the plants are responding to. So, you know, if you have a, a pretty wide floodplain forest, it's okay to have openings. Matter of fact, they're really great for wildlife. Deer like to go there, bears, 
cougars, lot, you know, a lot of different things use in birds, use openings. Um, there's a lot of, you know, then you create edge habitat in a forest. Um, so, you know, we will go in and, and put some native seeding in here and also great for pollinators. So, and it just, it just brings back that, that diversity into the, the floodplain forest, the riparian forest. Again, I use things interchangeably, riparian, floodplain, uh, streamside, these are all what, what I'm talking about with the, the native forest. Um, and like I mentioned before, some projects I plant on. Uh, so if it's necessary and it seems like uh, maybe there's some areas that had a lot of either disturbance from humans or um, maybe it's the edge of a pasture that we want to increase the buffer width on. Sometimes planting is necessary. And then there's just some areas that, you know, is possible that the blackberry was so thick that it's just not coming back like the rest of it. I usually don't do that, but sometimes uh, I will prescribe some planting to fill in some of those holes. Most of the time, I'll leave them as wildlife openings. <clears throat> so if you remember, I, uh, I mentioned the passive riparian rehabilitation, the, the passive uh, restoration. And just I just have some pictures. I, I've had some text up on there on a lot of these slides. So these are just pictures of either projects or you know some native plants. So again, the passive restoration. We built this fence. So there's grazing cows over here. Uh, we fenced the cows off the creek. The creek's right over here. This plant, this was project was actually planted. Um, and that was 2016. I think I took this picture in 2020, so it's recovering really nicely. Um, and I have, like I said, I have contractors. Uh, this is Marlin. He he has built a lot of fence for me in a lot of a lot of difficult places. Uh, so, and I just have some pictures. This is in the middle here, Spirea, Douglas Spirea. It's a really nice plant. It's can be inundated by water and it can also tolerate drought. So again, species are adapted to exist in some interesting places in a riparian forest. So this is the, the active restoration again. So we use different methods. Um, and crews are great. Uh, use, they use chainsaws that cut the blackberries. Um, this, this company has a, a found this really awesome hard steel blade that can handle cutting the blackberries. Um, sometimes we'll use machines that are flat and not close to the creek. Um, you know, this one's along the edge of a field. So they're just mowing that because you can do a lot more um, at a time and it, a, this is a great example of how tall the blackberry is on some of these projects. And this is pretty, actually pretty common, um, how tall the blackberry is. You can see that here on, the, on this picture on the left as well, of the machines mowing. Um, and then, you know, not to discount it, loppers are great tools. I call it surgery. Once we get a project moving in the, in the recovery, uh, stages, you know, going in and being careful amongst the native plants and trimming back blackberries before they get too tall and start, I call them tendrils, they start sending out these leaders and, it, you know, you can find them eight, 10 feet of, out and then, and you start pulling on them and that end has rooted itself eight to 10 feet out from its original um, source. So, Keeping those, keeping the blackberry trim back, and then they're also easier to spray. You don't have to use as much herbicide to spot spray. It's a lot of advantages, and I 
I um, am a big advocate of this surgery with whoppers even. <clears throat> and like I mentioned, we use chemical, not just weed control. We use, uh, and I can talk about this more uh, in our discussion if we want like aquatic labeled herbicide. It's, you know, these are all approved by uh, the federal government to be used along streams and creeks. Um, again, timing is key for each species. This is a picture here down in the bottom left of Dyer's Woad. Um, and we try to get these kinds of broadleaf weeds early. So they're just setting up, putting up the rosettes, get them, you know, we get them early. Uh, so again, we don't have to use as much herbicide. And making sure you have the right chemical for the right plant. And if anyone has any questions about that, I'm pretty knowledgeable uh, because I've been doing this for a while. And, you know, uh, I can answer questions like that if you have any questions. <clears throat> so another kind of guiding thing that I use that, uh, you know, with the work of implementing these projects is the integrated pest management. And I, you know, this was developed through Western Invasive Network. Um, it's, you know, from 2015, there's hasn't been an updated one, although this is a great resource. So I'm sure Rachel um, has other resources uh, and, you know, you can find things. Uh, I really like this one. I've been using this one since I started doing this. Um, and, uh, it's really great. So a lot of good tips, you know, so you have a mechanical chemical and then the integrated pest management, you know, which is a combination essentially. And that's how we do the rele release and recruit. <clears throat> and then can't say this enough times, stewardship and adaptive management. So again, getting commitment, being, you know, really on top of getting the, the riparian forest recovering in a tra trajectory that it's going to be successful and then being open minded and adapting uh, and doing th different things based on what a site tells you. I just have two pictures. These are both restoration projects that I manage. Um, so we had cut the blackberries and you can see all the dead canes. Uh, that we had cut uh, before bird nesting, and then we came back, and um, these are re-sprouts of blackberry coming back. This is the first year, and we, we came back and sprayed those, but that what's great is, look at all the native, I mean, this is literally, we cut this in February, and by July, these native plants had started popping up, all over the place on this project. And then this, this picture was taken after like two years of uh, doing the release and recruit. And we actually, here you can see, we planted plants. They're all still very small. This is natural recruitment of the common snowberry. I mean, you have plants like cow parsnip popping up on this project. So it fills in pretty quickly once you get, and this was full of blackberry when we started. It was, yeah, 10, 15 feet tall in this section. And then this, here's another example. Uh, so just kind of keep in mind, this isn't an actual photo point that I, I always establish photo points for projects. Uh, these are two cottonwood trees, but you can kind of see the blackberries. They were probably, you know, eight, eight feet tall at that point. And if you just kind of, so you, that's an angle and then kind of orient yourself. Now I'm standing down in where the Blackberry was. And uh, here's the two trees from this first picture. And then just keep your eye on this cottonwood um, because this was, you know, that's 2018, 2019. And again, we put some plants in here and in 2020. So this was all natural recruitment that came in. This is all snowberry and rose. It's just filling in. I call it 
I'd say it's filling in and there's cottonwoods that are growing in here. So a whole diversity of, of na native plants are coming in. So you, you know, you start with that, next year is that, and then the next year, it's really coming back. This project's doing really well. <clears throat> here is a photo point. So this was on a, a large floodplain forest that I've been kind of showing you LIDAR and, and uh, pictures of and things like that. Uh, so this was a, a wall of blackberry down on this, this riparian floodplain forest. So keep your eye on kind of this V alder here. And then there's a pine tree. There's a ponderosa pine way in the back there. So that's what it looks like after two years. So we've been, this, this project started in also in 2018. Uh, so, and you know, what's really great to me is here's the V and the alder tree. There's an entire tree laying down <laughs> underneath there that fell over all on its own. You can't even see it. So it's another example of, uh, it's possible to do this and recover the native riparian forest. So here's another, just another example of a project. We cut the blackberry in the winter time. Um, this was, I believe, the following spring. We went and there's reed canary grass, which is another noxious weed. We were trying to keep from out competing the plantings that we did along this pasture. We put a fence up. Uh, for this horse that lives there. And then this was actually this week, I was out with the contractor and we were just kind of scalping around. This is a reed canary grass again. And so these plants have, are growing. They were planted in the winter of 2019. So they've been through 19, 20, 21. It's their fourth growing. They've been through four growing seasons. So we're just still maintaining it, still uh, trying to fight back this reed canary grass. And I'll just I'll just finish up here. Um, so kind of the the process. If you were to work with the watershed council, you know, through various ways of getting into contact. Uh, sometimes, you know, someone like myself will call you on the phone if we're interested in an area, like if you lived in Elk Creek, um, and you set up a site visit, and then we design a project together. Um, I will go, someone like myself would go find funding to fund it. Um, just so, like, if you work at the Watershed Council, typically, we don't ask landowners to provide any money. This is all uh, a service. So then we can, you know, once we get to a point where we're comfortable, the project's gonna move forward, we can we sign a cooperative landowner agreement, and that can be anywhere from five to ten years. I have eight years years here. Um, so we do monitoring past when we have funding. Um, and I would secure a Jackson or Josephine County riparian permit. Now that if you live up north in the Willamette, uh, counties don't have this that I know of, at least where I worked. Um, I worked up in the Willamette for years. Um, so I could help you secure that. There's, there's you know, county ordinances about disturbing uh, vegetation along streams and rivers in these two counties. And so we, I would help someone do that or just put you, we have a blanket permit that I could put you on. Um, and it moves into the implementation and stewardship. So that's kind of like the very quick version of how one of these projects comes together. Whoops. <clears throat> and then um, if anyone, you know, I have some discussion topics and we're gonna have, I'm sure people have put questions up uh, in the chat. 
you have any questions about securing those permits or any other regulations, I can tell you what I know. Rachel is also a great resource. Uh, if you have any, you want to talk about the herbicide in use, totally comfortable talking about that. Uh, we have resources for contractors and then nurseries, plant material, if you're interested in that. Um, if you're interested in other entities um, that, that are involved or resources, and I know Rachel, um, she's a wealth of knowledge and connections for that. Um, so with that, uh, that's my presentation. Looks like I hit about, that's well, right on time, I guess. <laughs> yeah, nice, thanks. So much, Lance. We have some good questions in the chat. So let's, uh, those are good discussion topics and some of those are here in the chat as well, but let's, uh, let's start with our questions in the chat. My cat is trying to get my attention here. <laughs> Did I uh, stop sharing my screen? <laughs> yeah, I think so. And, okay. and if folks want to um, turn on their videos, you're welcome to at this point. Let's see, let me go back here. Um, shish now. Okay, so could you, Marcy asked, what herbicides do you use um, what, uh, on the blackberries? And I know that that's a question that a lot of people have, have about that. Could you elaborate a little bit and maybe talk about the label? I know it's pretty common for folks to not read the label. The labels are really dense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> but yes. it's really, really important that you do. So I only have contractors use a chemical called triclopyr. Now there are different, you know, brand names. Um, there's like Garland 3A, that's aquatically approved. Um, there's a newer one that's out that's called Vaseline um, that you don't have to use as high a concentration. It's more of a slower release. So these these chemical companies are actually developing, um, you know, they're evolving as in trying not to be as harsh on the environment as, as time progresses and, you know, the science is moving in that direction. So for blackberries, triclopyr. And so I use two different strategies on the initial treatment of blackberry. And some of the, if so, if I have funding of, available at the beginning of a project, my preference is to actually spray in the fall. So if you find a, a warm day in October, um, after the native uh, plants have dropped their leaves. Um, so like I mentioned during my talk, there could be snowberry underneath these dense blackberry stands. So we kind of watch and see the native plants start dropping leaves. They have shut down for the winter. Well, the blackberry, as you know, it still has green leaves. So it's pulling in all the energy into its root system. And so if you spray the blackberries, because you have all that surface area before you cut it, I have found over the years, guided by contractors who are very knowledgeable, you will get a 95 to 100 percent kill on those blackberries and they do not come back very well after that because they're absorbing all their energy into their root system so you're really concentrating that into their roots now there's other ways too as i mentioned as i was talking sometimes we will cut the blackberry stands um, before bird nesting. So I try to do it in February. I mean, that's, if I could do it in January, I would, um, you know, you're really eliminating, basically you have great horn owls starting nest in February. Um, so really trying to avoid the songbird nesting. Um, and then again, so you cut all that, that surface vegetation off, and then you can go back in and you can spray the re-sprouts, essentially. Kind of like that picture I showed uh, where there are native plants coming up into the blackberries um, that we had cut. Uh, so that, that is, uh, that's the, that's, I only use triclopyr. 
There are some people who want to use glyphosate. Only thing that I've seen glyphosate do is burn the end of the plant and it, it doesn't really do much. Honestly, that's, that's me. Um, I know people have different ideas, but I always look at it. If I'm going to use a chemical, I want it to be really effective so I don't have to use it very much. So that's... So That's you can use less, right? Yeah. So, some some folks are like, I want it to be really effective, and so they use, you know, more than is needed. No, not yeah. not higher concentration. Right. You know, follow the label if you're doing mm -hmm. it yourself, or hire someone who you know is following the label, that, because those are really strict. And again, these are all chemicals that there's national National Marine Fisheries Service NIMS is the acronym. They are all been approved by NIMS. So like Triclopyr, you can't spray within five feet of the water, you know, that kind of thing. So they're, they're it's all on the labels. You, you have to read the labels. Um, Wayne asks um, about, and this is something I hear people say, and I'm not, I don't think that I've seen it or would think that it would happen, but um, can you leave the mowed blackberry as a mulch if it's been kind of masticated? Uh, do the leaves or the canes reroot or sprout? Do they root if they're left on the ground? I have not seen that. So my strategy is they make, the only thing that a, an Armenian blackberry is good for, in my opinion, is mulch. So I, if, if I have contractors cut them, I, I have them cut them up into, uh, if they use chainsaws, I have them cut them in like foot sections. That way they can't, that you're, you're basically cutting it up so it doesn't have any energy. Um, but yeah, they're great mulch. They actually suppress some noxious weeds a little bit. And I, I haven't really seen it suppressing uh, the native plants coming back. And they usually kind of melt into the soil pretty quickly. Once you kill them and they're on, getting them on the ground is really key. Cause if anyone's ever walked through dead blackberry stands, they actually become even worse after they're dead. Their thorns will stick in. <laughs> so I like no using kidding. Your <laughs> um, let's see. So, uh, and you, uh, you kind of answered that question about habitat and the, the big, the big thing with blackberries is to not to avoid the birding bird nesting season so february really march maybe april may june i think yeah it, right? you know i like to be out of there i don't want to even march you know i think april april you really don't want to be cutting blackberries on at a large scale for sure i think that like the audubon society recommends between march and june if i've got that right so yeah, um yeah. that's what i but, but i but i think february i mean in February, the birds start making noise and acting like they're they're talking to each other for sure. So, exactly. um, let's see what are some other relative ones. Um, uh, but in terms of other things like dens or things, there is you got to kind of take the long view on that. I think that you're going to create better native habitat. Yes. And if you're, yeah. Yep. Yep. We're creating a disturbance for sure. There's gonna there's going to be things that are potentially acute, uh, acutely impacted, um, but, you know, that's, that's the decisions that are made. And the, the long, yes, the long view is the way, because all of those species are going to benefit way more having the native vegetation that they have evolved with back into the ecosystem. Right. Um, and there were some questions. I provided a link to the really useful Jackson Soil and Water Conservation Service. Um, they have a list of all kinds of lists of plants recommended for different kind of contexts, including streams and riparian areas. But um, somebody was asking, are there certain species that you re would really recommend for, um, let's see, including at the five-year intensive treatment Let's see, wait a second. No, I lost it. Um, plants to replace the blackberry or prevent it from coming back in. So like plants that are especially good at outcompeting it. Yeah, there's some, so snowberry spreads pretty quickly. Rose, native rose species, well, you know, they grow in thickets. So if you can get shrubs that grow in thickets, that'll really start 
occupying the space. So it's really it's really occupying the space. Um, it's so the blackberries can't you know start taking over again. Uh, choke cherry is another great a great one that right. you know. You know, I I have a project that had one literally one tall choke cherry that grew up over the blackberries, and two two years. I mean, there's a there's a radius of a a patch that's like twenty five feet now, and it's only taken a couple of years. It's pretty nice. amazing. That's kind of using the same strategy, choke cherry, where the birds are eating the berries and yes, spreading yeah. them around. Yep. Um, let's see, the five plus years of intensive treatments, is that five years of noxious weed control work, including or excluding any native plant replanting in that same period? Yeah, so that's that's five years of noxious weed treatment. Um, and like where I'm at right now with this release and recruit, I, I prefer not to plant because as if you live in Southern Oregon, it's really hard to establish plants and you have to have irrigation. And with the drought we're in, I mean, I don't really want to be irrigating native plants uh, and pulling from the creek to do that or pulling from, you know, any, all the irrigation districts pull, get water from the streams. So I try not to plant and I'm finding that, you know, that the plants are coming back. That So you have locally, adapted plants right there on the project um, and you just really I'm just very focused on controlling the noxious weeds and letting the natural recruitment happen. So um, I know that it used to be that for the riparian permit to, in Jackson and Josephine County you had to have a replanting plan is that not the case are they accepting this strategy? I am using that strategy and yes they are starting to accept that that you know it's hitting the target of oregon department of fish and wildlife stems per acre right. yeah if you can show that you know does it matter if it's planted from a nursery or if it comes up out of the ground where it existed in the you know the seeds are dropped there's a huge seed bank so I think that Jackson County especially is coming around, you know, so like I said, we kind of have a blanket per riparian permit and that is written in. Um, and that was a collaborative uh, effort by many people, you know, around the valley working with ODF and W and working with Jackson County to accept that. Um, if I was to write a planting plan and send it to ODFNW for a specific landowner, I have written that strategy into it and it's been accepted and I have oh, that's great. It. That is super. That's yep. really great. It's really great. Wow. And, I mean, so have you have you actually quantified it? Like, have you uh, is it something that could be compared side by side? Because I know you have to track how many stems or like survival rates, depending on what your funding source is. Have you compared this strategy with replanting and stems afterwards? Not, not yet. I would love for that. Sounds like a great There's research a, project. <laughs> there for does. A, for it a sure master's does. student. <laughs> yeah, and probably it's just a matter of looking at the data that is available from it, some of this it, monitoring. I'm, yeah. Totally. Yeah. That's great. Yep. Uh, let's see here. Another question. Is the five to seven year period for recruit and release for a certain land acreage, can it take a shorter time for smaller zones? So maybe clarify kind of what that time period is about. Sure. Um, it's usually uh, kind of the accepted five years and uh, through experience, it, you know, you're, I'm really getting comfortable after five years of that treatment to where you're not seeing re-sprouts of noxious weeds. Um, it, that doesn't always mean, you know, like I said, I kind of let sites tell me what's happening. And so I've had sites that have come back really fast. Um, and so we're not spending as much time doing the, the noxious weed, the, the release anymore. And I've had sites that are have not recovered very quickly at all. So, I, it, you know, it just depends. The acre size doesn't really matter, you know, to me. 
I think is the backstory on that kind of like in the early days of restoration, a place would be restored and then nobody would go back and look at it and nothing. And then someone would wander over, you know, 15 or 20 years later. And it was just like nothing had ever happened. It, isn't that what it's about to like really ensure that you're, that the effort you're putting in is. Yeah. It's yeah. taking hold and moving forward and allowing that, uh, that improved habitat to maintain itself. Yeah, that's exactly it. So it becomes, it's, you know, we're just helping it at, at year five or seven, you know, we're just, we're just assuring that the, the forest is, is recovering all on its own. Um, okay. Um, do you want to, th there's another species question here. And again, I put that list there, but do you have, um, there's a question about what's in your native seeding mix. So maybe some of the more herbaceous species that you're putting in there or oh, yeah sure there's a lot, there's a lot to lot. choose from yeah i mean bunch grasses uh annual grasses you know a lot of wildflower you know yarrow i'm just clarkia uh oregon sunshine oregon sunshine <laughs> yep you know i really like the native bunch grasses the, the fescue in the oak grass and you know those are great if you're if you're really wanting to encourage wildlife use to, to, and there's a ton of resources you can find <clears throat> find really good native uh, yeah native. yeah especially here in southwest oregon there's been a lot of work on that i think it's becoming more available mm -hmm. um if i get a second i'll put uh the understory initiative is a great one to look up uh climate siski seeds they yeah, have sources sometimes you live up north there's uh uh pacific northwest i think that's their name i used to get seed from them a lot they they you know because the grass grassy capital of the world is in lynn county so a lot of those grassy growers have started growing native grasses um so there's a there's a lot of a lot of resources for sure Okay, and then uh, then another weed related question. How do you handle recruitment by reed canary grass and poison hemlock after yeah. you take out the blackberry? Yeah, that's what happens. You get rid of the blackberry and usually it's hemlock and teasel go. They have a lot of fun with all that open space. So yeah, again, like hitting those broadleaf plants when they're very small rosettes. Um, reed canary grass, um, Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you just got to pick your battles um, with reed. Reed canary grass is one of those noxious weeds um, that I struggle with because again, so that will grow right in the channel. I'm not spraying in the channel um, over the water. It's just not happening. Uh, so a lot of, you know, removing it mechanically, it's a grass. So imagine that. Um, <laughs> it's a that's a tough one but i'll battle it with contractors where i think um i have seen it converted and you know if you if you cut it back enough next thing you start see seeing native bull rush native sedges start coming back mm. and you know it is possible i don't want anyone to think that it's not possible but that is a challenge uh for sure yeah um, um let's see question about grants uh and this is probably specific but they say do you do you not have match requirements for your grants or do you have match requirements yes yes we do yeah. there is match yeah yeah like oweb is usually 25 percent. we try to do 50 around 50 um and, and it depends on what grant granting uh source that you go to um, but we try to diversify ourselves uh, as much as possible. And as part of that match can be time, right? Time counts as money, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Right. Yep. In-kind match is, is pretty big. Landowners can supply a lot of that. Um, we have, I work with different agencies and, you know, like some of them write in-stream permits for me. That's match, you know, that, that kind of thing. So. Right. That's great. Uh, let's see. Do you think that climate change and our increasingly warm, dry summers will affect future success for such projects, especially plant recruitment and survival? I think that's 
possible. I'm not as worried uh, in a riparian forest. Um, you know, I haven't, I didn't touch on this really because I was focused on the riparian rehabilitation side of things, but we are, we're also restoring stream processes on these projects. So like I mentioned, um, storing water on the floodplain, um, that's huge. So we really need to think about, especially with climate change, really kind of stepping back and evaluating what we're doing along streams these days um, and it, the activities of humans. And so giving it more space is really critical, especially now. Um, yeah. And if you live down here, you know, what a dominated understory of blackberry looks like when it catches on fire it's horrible you yeah. Know? yeah let's see here so here's a question there's there is a geranium shiny geranium but um do you want to maybe comment on that this is an understory in oak the shiny geranium control yeah, yeah. i mean i would have to i'd have to um either send you to someone else who's a botanist or I'd have to research. Um, Rachel and I were talking before we started, you know, in the Willamette, it's really widespread and it's not um, as much, it hasn't established itself down here. So there are ways to, that we should probably all be paying it really close attention. Um, so it doesn't become like, projects I worked on up in the Willamette where we really had to not do anything to it because it was we just had to live with it throw your hands up yeah, yeah we would have been spraying a lot of herbicides to try and get rid of it too much right yeah. we'll have to pay attention to that um let's see I live in Clatsop County I have self-implemented trying to release along Circle Creek how do I access the stewardship program you describe. Do you know anything about, you know, about Clatsop County? You know, I, I think I was just going to throw in, like, reach out to your county extension. If you can find, figure out who your local watershed council or your county extension, if you can locate any one of these people, they can usually connect you into the web of resources. Mm -hmm. I don't I'm know. I'm trying to think of where that county is. <laughs> I think it's the Northwest. I think it is too. It's up, <laughs> yeah, it's up along the Columbia. Is that right? Yeah, I'm not pulling up my map right now. <laughs> yeah, there's a. I'm sure there's a watershed council that is servicing the areas. And those small yeah. landowner grants are often available in a lot of areas, although funding does vary for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see here. What's a reasonable timeline to anticipate between making contact with the watershed council and project funding or startup? That's a great question. <laughs> it, it is, and, and it can be really fast. Uh, like months, or it could take over a year. It depends, and it also depends on when I, like for myself, when I would start talking to someone. Um, and, you know, when funding opportunities come up, like OWEB is consistent. It's in the spring and in the fall. So they have two rounds every year. Um, and, uh, you know, other, you know, other, you know, I, I I just wrote, yeah, I've been writing grants a lot <laughs> since the fall. So I've written like five grants. Um, so they're all always coming up and moving. And so it, I would say for, for myself, I'd like to get to know to someone, you know, and one of the major things that I always do when I first start, start talking to a landowners, I, I just want to listen and find out what a landowner's goal is. And they have a vision for their property. Um, so, it, you know, that can be fast, that can be slow. It, it just depends. It's kind of like a project site. I kind of let it dictate to me and then respond to that. Um, so that's a really I, good question, though, because some people want to move really fast and some people, you know, want to take their time and think about it. So it yeah. just all depends. Right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Wayne asks, how do you select large scale power tool removal versus hand tool surgery with respect to not damaging the natives that are lurking under the blackberry thicket? 
That's a another really great question, Wayne. I appreciate that. I try to avoid using machinery <laughs> to do BlackBerry clear, clearing um, as much as possible. But sometimes it just makes sense, especially if you know we have. I have a project that I've started. I showed a picture of it. It's thirty five acres, so you know we had we used some of that along the edge. The thing is about a lot of shrubs, um, this is shrubs, not necessarily, you know, trees don't operate this way, but shrubs have evolved being browsed by wildlife. They actually kind of like it sometimes. Like snowberry responds really well to being uh, cut a little bit or browsed. So I don't worry too much about the, the shrubs, um, but definitely the trees and, you know, the contractors I use, if the tree is, you know, six or eight feet tall, they can see it. They won't, they won't cut it. They'll go around it. So just being careful. You can even be careful with a skid steer or a mini excavator if, if you have skilled people. So right, I, right. I like the hand tools because yeah, it's more like surgery. Right. Even with surgery with a chainsaw, I always joke. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. I talk about backhoe ballet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, let's see. Do you know, can you say more about the ODFW target stems per acre? Uh, where, is the, where is that documented or does it vary? And I just wanted to point out, if you're watching the chat, Michelle Tucker is really on top of some of these things. She's put a few of these resources that nice. have been mentioned into the chat. So go back uh, and look at those. I'll pull up my chat. Oh yeah, it looks like yeah, it looks like she put clats up watersheds. Yeah, yep. Um, the stems per acre, it you know here, it, it's six hundred and forty stems per acre is the the recommended ODF and W, uh, and I think that I know what that's based off of. That's a that's a forestry thing for sure. Um, so, is there if folks go and they search our Jackson County O would they see the requirements for a plan? Like if they wanted to make a plan themselves? I, I believe, yeah, the, about that. it's online. There's a, mm -hmm. you have to make a landscape plan. That, that's what it would be under. It's, it's yeah. titled landscape. In the, and would they look at the county site for that? Or the yeah, Jackson okay. County. Okay. Yeah. And yep. Josephine County has one. Right. Just, okay. That's what I thought. I'm in the process. I of, know where the ordinance is, but. Um, yeah, I think. But I think there, I think I have seen that like plan template or, or hey, something yep. like that. Absolutely. Yeah. That's where I got the original one. When Maybe I... Michelle will track that down for us. <laughs> or, uh, or you can look it up, Google around. Let's see. Um, any need to install erosion control practices while completing the release phase? Or are you finding that plant debris generated is sufficient mulch cover? Yes. <laughs> okay yeah leaving the blackberry canes on the ground is a great way as erosion control too thank you for pointing that out because that is you know the other thing about i would like to clarify if someone ever has ever told you that blackberries are erosion control that is not true right. Good. It, it if you go and stand in a creek and you lift the blackberries draped over the side, you will see that it's all eroded underneath behind that because blackberries, they can't tolerate having their, I say, can't have their feet wet for that long a time. So I've had many landowners tell me, well, if you cut all the blackberries, my bank's going to erode even more. And that's just not, that's not true. The blackberry. Yeah. Yeah. Over. Right. Good. Good for mentioning that. And Cammie Kern says, uh, she's found native blue wild rye that we seeded at a project is somewhat competitive with shiny geranium. So that's hopeful. Oh, cool. That's good. <laughs> uh, let's see. Can you suggest who to work with in Douglas County? So if you reach out to Alicia Christensen, she's the um, OSU forester at Extension there, and she would definitely be connected. And I'm not sure. I, uh, let's see. Umpqua. Is Umpqua up there? There, is, yeah. there are lots of watershed councils. So do you know who's up, would be in Douglas County watershed council? I think council? there's an Umpqua partnership. I think there's an Elk Creek watershed council. Yeah, that's right. Which is a tributary. Um, that sounds right. It looks like uh, Michelle Tucker 
also put up Elk Creek Watershed. Okay, all right, go. good. She's on it. Okay. All right, good. Good. We we got, oops. Yeah, we got to the end of the questions. I was worried they were really coming fast and furious there for a while, but we got them all. So, um, I don't know if there are any final questions or if there was something on your discussion list. Let's see, did I have a few? I think you really I think the people You really asked, covered it. They yeah. yeah. Great job everyone for asking yeah. really awesome questions and feedback. So, yeah, very good. All right. Thank you, Lance. Thank you for having me. I, I really enjoy coming to Land Stewards and doing presentations. Yeah, we love having you, Lance. And thanks, everybody, for showing up. And Michelle for fielding questions and everybody for chiming in when you knew the answers and putting up resources. That's always helpful. So um, we'll get this put into a recording. And at some point tomorrow, you'll get a copy of the recording. And people who weren't here will also get that. So can stop.